Ava. You're in the loop. We're here to discuss the ups, downs, and sideways of the sport of figure skating and maybe give you plus five GOE along the way. Let's introduce this week's hosts. Hi, I'm Leigh. I am currently trying to process that the JGP is happening and crying about my baby juniors. You can find me on Twitter at Axel Sandwich. Hi, I'm Kat, and I am so, so thankful that the figure skating season has finally started again. You can find me on Twitter at Kat Tweets with no ease. Hi, I'm Gab. I'm your costume enthusiast. You can find me on Twitter at Pegomas. Hi, I'm Bex, and I am counting down the day till I can actually photograph figure skating in person again. You can find me on Twitter at Bexfa. Cool, so we're really, really excited to have this episode because it's all about something that we can all rant for hours, um, yeah. just casually about. <laughs> um, it is the photography episode, and we are your resident photography enthusiasts, along with a lot of other people in our team. But I think we're like being tasked to represent uh, all of that love and bring it to you guys. We would also like to give a quick shout out and thank you to the listener who suggested the concept for this episode to Kat. We had such a blast putting this episode together and we really value listener suggestions and we'll do our absolute best to figure out how to implement them or incorporate them into future episodes. So please do send us suggestions, feel free to. Thank you so much for sending this one and we really hope you enjoy the end product. Thank you. So the way we're going to structure the episode today is um, a lot of listeners have really kindly sent in some really cool questions. So we'll be going through them and in the process, hopefully giving you a good rundown of all the basics that you need to know for figure skating photography. And there'll be some more resources and extra things in the show notes as well, if you want to um, find out more information. And we're obviously happy to answer follow up questions as well. Um, But before we do that, I guess um, it would be good to just give a quick introduction to ourselves and a little bit about our experience in all of these areas. Um, So Gab, do you want to go first? Uh, Yeah, sure. So I started photography when I was in college and I took photography classes. It was something I always liked doing and then I actually learned it. I applied my knowledge in photographing cosplays and stuff and then I thought why not photograph figure skaters when I'd go to a competition. So that's basically how I went about it. It's just like, yeah, why not? And you're also a graphic designer, yeah? Yeah, so yeah, I'm a graphic designer and I also do banners, which I'm sure a lot of people have already seen last season and I'm doing more this upcoming season as well, so. Your banners are so iconic. (laughs) I'm so excited for the debuts. Oh yes, there's gonna be so many good ones. I'm really excited. So... I basically started photography in high school when my dad decided one day that he wanted to buy one of those like starter DSLR kits from Costco and he was like oh I want to do photography and then in the end I ended up falling in love with it instead like he never took his camera out and I took it instead and then it just kind of went from there um so then I in college I took a lot of headshots and senior portraits did a lot of Um, photos for formals and sororities and those kinds of things and so it's mostly recreational for me Um, and then I just like taking photos of people so I mean figure skaters are people beautiful people so it's again a natural extension of what I loved shooting. So I probably have been doing slightly more serious photography the least amount out of everyone here I have always really loved photography, but I was like a tragically poor uni student who couldn't really justify indulging in the expense of good gear, which I made the mistake of not doing before I went to uni. So I pretty much actually use figure skating as a challenge to cut my teeth on getting better at photography and a really good motivator about a year and a half ago. So I actually learned a lot about photography on the fly while trying to shoot competitions in between sort of like using it a lot recreationally to photograph, you know, I love photographing nature if anyone has ever talked to me, (laughs) Um, to photograph people in nature and just try to improve a lot of different areas that I like. But it was a really good like high level challenge for me just to be like, okay, I'm going to start tackling and really use this as a motivation to improve my photography game since I know I'm going to be at several competitions this year. 
So I mostly just started like more seriously about a year and a half, but I've always loved it for 10 years or so. Great. And how did you become our resident flower crown queen? By wanting to save money <laughs> because Kat had this, bre- like Kat and I were watching Skate America last season. We saw someone give Kauri a flower crown and we were like, oh, we should do that. We're going to be at Skate Canada shortly. We should do this. And Kat was like linking me on Amazon. I was like, girl, we can just, we can just make this ourselves. <laughs> so... That is how I spawned a terrible addiction between me and Kat. And now we have made like probably about 70 flower crowns, be- like each of us. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a shameful status, honestly. <laughs> but hopefully people still enjoy the prettiness and the silliness. And it, you know, is quite a happy antic to engage in. So. We are probably Michael's top patron, like at this point. <laughs> Cool. And just to introduce my photography background, um, I've been shooting for about six years now. I got my first DSLR proper camera that was mine as a like half of it was paid by my parents as a reward for good uni results. And I paid for the other half. And it was probably the worst camera to buy as a beginner because my dad went full Asian dad and was like, if you're going to get a camera, it better be a good one. I bought it a Canon 5D Mark II. So anyone who knows will know that that's like a professional grade camera. And then my Asian self kicked in and was like, if I'm going to have paid so much for this camera, I'm going to use it. So I started off shooting um, events at uni um, and then that kind of snowballed into fashion, into portraits travel, food, and also a wedding that I shot. So it is kind of a little business that I have on the side, um, but I haven't shot sports photography before. So figure skating was a completely new area for me, but it was something that, again, I love shooting beautiful people. I think this is a common theme. And so that's how I got started with it. So (laughs) what we want to do then is we'll move on to all the different photography questions that people have asked. And I guess the first one that we'll go into is someone um, has asked, is there a good point and shoot camera that you can recommend for photographing skating and any beginner tips um, on how to get started? Well, I mean, the most important thing we want to emphasize is that photography is for everyone. Like anyone can do it. You can use your phone. You can use whatever cheap camera you have lying around. Um, There's more to photography than just having the best camera or the best lens. So most people have, you know, their smartphone. A little bit higher up than that will be like your typical point and shoot. And then if you want to upgrade more, there's also mirrorless and DSLRs. And then there are also different types of DSLRs. There's a full frame and then there's crop sensors like APS-C. So that's usually the trend that people go or move up in, in terms of buying your cameras. And then once you, you know, invest into in the DSLR, then you also have different types of lenses um, and then you can upgrade your your camera bodies. And there are lots of different ways to kind of um, improve your gear as you move forward through photography. Yeah, but I think what people mean when they say, oh, I really want to get into photography as opposed to like getting better at the photographs they already take is when you make that leap from using your phone and point and shoot, which are like cameras that don't have detachable lenses to swap out um, your lens because that opens up the world of possibilities for um, different types of photography. Because essentially what makes photos very different on a technical level is the type of lens that you use. Um, And so that's usually the biggest jump from a financial perspective and also from a commitment perspective. And so that's mainly what we're going to focus on um, under the assumption that people um, who are asking these questions are interested in kind of delving into the world of DSLR and mirrorless photography. But if you want any tips on sort of phone photography and how to get better at shooting on your phone, um, I have written up a guide in my own uh, blog and will write like a short introduction as well for the In The Loop website, just giving you some tips on getting better at your phone photography as well. We'll be talking later in the episode about how you can make this entire journey of buying a camera more affordable because you don't have to buy things new. Um, so stay tuned for that. But first, we'll talk a little bit about shooting specifically for figure skating. So I think that all of us really started photographing figure skating um, more frequently last year, last season. The first uh, figure skating event that I really shot 
anything for was Stars on Ice in April of last year. And that's completely different from competitions because, I mean, it's um, stage lighting. So you have spotlights and a dark background. So like a lot of the settings you have to adjust in stage lighting versus competition regular rink lighting. And how would you like normally recommend alternating your settings for that for people? Because I think one of the difficulties of photographing shows straight off too is the fact that you don't necessarily like if you go to a competition you can go to the practice for most places other than some competitions in Japan and stuff um it's generally pretty normal you know what's anticipating but for a show if it hasn't been aired or if you haven't had necessarily fan reports hasn't been covered that much you don't necessarily know the programs people are skating you don't know the group numbers you don't know what the lighting is so how would you how do you generally tend to anticipate that or do you just I usually just shoot on the fly kind of personally and like lift up my camera and take interesting shots so. let me just say that shooting group numbers is the worst thing in the world <laughs> it's terrible you can't shoot group numbers properly from the audience there's like, too many people it's like synchroing group numbers are the bane of your existence there's yeah. just no way to pull it off well <laughs> so I end up using those intro group numbers during shows and galas as my opportunity to try to get the light the settings right because I can't you can't focus on like one person in a group number it never ever looks good like so that's what I usually end up doing so as for the setting, so all of us shoot with a mirrorless or DSLR. So we all shoot manual. So if we sh if you shoot manual, that means that you adjust your settings, all the settings on the camera yourself. It's not like the auto um, where they kind of optimize the settings based on um, the environment in which you're shooting. You have a lot more control if you shoot manual, but that also means that you need to know what all of those different functions do. So... When I'm shooting at a gala, I try to keep my shutter speed pretty high because you already have a low light. So if you have a low shutter speed, a lot of your images are going to be blurry because the longer your shutter is open, the more light gets through and you're going to end up with this kind of blurry image. I also try to keep my ISO as low as possible, but it's pretty hard when you're in a dark setting again because the lower your ISO is, the darker your image is because the ISO is the sensitivity of your sensor. So the lower the ISO, the less grain that you'll have in your images, but it's also going to be darker. So I try to keep the ISO somewhere between 1000 and 1600 so that it's not too grainy, but I also get enough light in. And the aperture is largely dependent on what kind of lens you get. You just keep your aperture as high as you possibly can, which is a lower f-stop number. So I try to play around with the ISO and uh, the shutter speed as much as I can and keep my aperture on the largest possible aperture, which is, again, the lowest f-stop. And side note that sometimes galas can snake you just a tiny bit if they have really wonky, inconsistent lighting, or if you're like, I, when I was shooting Grand Prix Final, from the seats that Yogs and I were sitting from, the spotlights were angled, like, horrendously <laughs> for us, and it honestly ruined a lot of my photos just because the angle of the light so that can be quite hard to control for and you kind of just have to deal with it or wing it or cry and try to move to another seat if it's not a very crowded event but mostly just there'll be a lot of kind of surprise challenges so keep checking your photos and just adjusting as best you can to try to get something <laughs> but they're a lot of fun to shoot because they have much more dramatic variance in lighting and setting than you get in a competition gav and i had that issue too yeah. at grand prix final because we were sitting in opposite sides but the same end of the ring <laughs> right we were both kind of short sideish towards the kiss and cry and it was it was yeah. sort of a rough lighting was not in our favor so just roll with it and in general at gpf it was just weird yeah in what way so regarding lighting I've shot in a decent amount of rinks by now. Probably the best drink for that had the best lighting where I looked at it and I was like, oh, I can keep my ISO so low. It's so bright. The white balance is great. I don't have to do too many adjustments. Was probably the one for US Nationals because it was a super new rink. But Grand Prix Final was so wonky. It felt like a rink where they had had like the lighting and like, you know, when you go to someone's house and they just like, you know, a light goes out and they screw in whatever random light bulb that they found or someone donated to them. So it's all different sorts of lights. 
that was very much how Grand Prix Final was. You shot one way and your light was completely different. The white balance was super wonky and then you shot like slightly different angle down the rink and it was totally different. So editing and adjusting for a white balance for just shooting one program, like one run through was an absolute nightmare in that rink. Yeah. During practices is our time usually to kind of get an idea of what the lighting situation is. It's a good opportunity to also become familiar with the program as well so that you know what parts of the program you'd be interested in shooting. But yeah, Grand Prix Final, I basically gave up taking Grand Prix Final photos. Yeah, I remember I would take pictures towards like where Bex and Yogita were sitting and it would be super yellow. And then I'd take pictures on the complete other side and my white balance and lighting would be great. And then I'd shoot like towards where the kiss and cry was and be super dark. So it was just a, a real nightmare. I th- I think one thing to consider sometimes, I think a lot of skating fans when they're buying tickets for an event to sit at, they're like, oh, we've got to be like within this many rows and we've got to be judges side or, you know, we want to be opposite judges side, but we want to be alongside. And that's not necessarily depending on what you like to capture when doing photography. Those aren't always necessarily the best seats. Like I would much rather sit short side to capture a lot of disciplines than sit opposite judges. Right. Because short side, you can get, you know, you can be by the twist corner, you can get step sequences. If someone has a straight step sequence and comes down the rink, you can get amazing shots and so much eye contact or setup or lifts look gorgeous. But sometimes when you're opposite judges, even if like your seats are generally quite fun and good, like if you're more central for actual ice coverage and other aspects you're just going to get a lot of backs or the choreography isn't going to be really presenting it's really rough for ice dance like if you want to shoot ice dance probably don't sit opposite judges oh yeah I was at a competition two weeks ago in, in like a local Quebec competition and since there was only one side for the seats basically I only got like shots of people's backs for ice dance it was really bad yeah ice dance is one of those um disciplines well really all of them but like ice dance is one of those disciplines you want to be on the judges side because otherwise you will just have two backs staring at you (laughs) at four continents I was sitting in the like opposite the judges side because apparently all of the seats were opposite the judges side in the corner too so I did not get a lot of good ice dance photos that were during like the programs because all I saw was their backs <laughs> and usually people are doing crossovers in that corner so all I get is like them doing back crossovers in that corner past me so a lot of their photos that I took of like ice dancers faces while during warm-ups as they were like stroking around the rink <laughs> one thing you can kind of do like if you don't have ideal seats for photography one thing that's really useful sometimes is okay you have kind of two options you can either sit in your actual assigned seats um during if you do go to practice or if you decide you want to and sort of figure out okay like someone runs through a program and you're like oh my gosh like when I was at Grand Prix Final I like looked at somebody I'd be like oh this lift I can get this part of the choreography perfectly from my seat it's great but you know also you can take advantage especially if it's not like a complete mob or something like usually it's not practicing or something you can kind of flit around the arena and be like okay well I want to see like what other programs look like I want to you know I'm not in the twist corner like I didn't take a single photo of a twist during Grand Prix Final so you can kind of flit around. Yeah, I think for photography purposes, um, what the key takeaway then is that number one, like the best photography seats are not necessarily the best seats for actually viewing a program. And then secondly, I think don't underestimate the good shots that you can get in practice, especially for like ice stands practice where they're pretty much made up already. Um, it's such a good opportunity to take photos. So I really, honestly, all of my photos came from practices and warm-ups rather than the actual program because um, of the very fact that you can potentially vary where you're sitting during practice so you can get better seats. Um, And also I think it's just a more relaxed time and you have a better chance of a skater like practicing an element in your corner where you're sitting, for example, when they're in practice, because they're not necessarily cleaving all the time to you know, their actual program. They could be practicing an element or a spin. And so definitely would recommend people attend practices if you're wanting to get good photography, if you're able to. In general, 
just like a couple of constant reminders because you never want to be stuck in these situations. Bring extra SD cards. Make sure you have enough storage for all your photos. There is literally nothing worse than realizing that your SD card is almost full and you're in the middle of shooting competitions and you're doing burst mode and shooting in raw <laughs> and you're just frantically deleting a bunch of photos. <laughs> it's hell. Like, also check, like, if you've been shooting a competition for a whole day, check that you transfer your photos, but check that you format your card before you started shooting. Because I did this w- my last day at Skate Canada practice and everyone knows I was having a meltdown because I had, like, 100 gigs of photos on my card. 120 and I had transferred them all and backed them up but I hadn't formatted and then I had taken shots of Shoma and Piper and Paul and was desperately trying to like mass delete everything so I could use the card it was a disaster so don't do that so if you don't have like enough storage like try to get a card especially if you're shooting in raw we'll talk about that later when we talk about editing but if it's if especially if you're shooting in raw you need that extra storage like I, I would recommend at least having one 128 gigabyte or maybe 64 gigabyte SD card to use for the day if you want to live on the edge right yeah, yeah. <laughs> 128 will be will, will give you a lot of I think that's probably like 6,000 5,000 photos so that should be okay for a day if you're not crazy which we all are try to have at least 128 gigabytes for one day of shooting and then be able to back up your photos and reformat. And then also know what your camera's battery life is as well. If you need to bring extra batteries, bring an extra battery, like have like one fully charged. Or if you know that your camera can last one day on just one battery, just make sure you charge it every single day. Like be vigilant about your camera's battery life. And also be aware that sometimes like rings are cold and batteries can underperform in the cold. Yes. You might witness your camera, actually, my camera was jumping from full battery to one bar and then jumping back again in the cold. So if you have that happen, like, don't panic, but definitely go outside for a bit, like, warm your camera up, as lame as that sounds. Um, because yes, you will sometimes be taken aback by those. It needs warmth <laughs> to yes. survive. Yeah, it's, it's like a sad, sad plant. If you can get an extra battery, it's always highly recommended to bring a backup for whatever reason because batteries will deteriorate naturally uh, as you use it so and you can also check the life of your battery i guess um in in your camera settings as well like if it has like 70 percent capacity that means like at full charge it's got about 70 percent of the charge that it would have had if it were brand new so be aware of that as well yeah also it's just hellishly hard to actually find a place to charge a battery if you do have a crisis at a rink so like seriously it's worth just even buying like a cheap ripoff backup just for like so you don't have to run around hunting for that so we had some questions around picking a camera and like the differences between camera bodies what cameras we use and like what we recommend or don't so we really wanted to sort of break this down into kind of several key points um so the first one i think is around when you're picking a camera what are the sort of factors you should be considering beyond your figure skating photography needs So Bex, I think you had some insight about that and why you chose your mirrorless. Right. So initially, one thing obviously was budget, just because these can vary quite a bit. And the camera, if I wanted to go for more of a full frame DSLR, it would have been like all nothing. It would have been about a thousand dollars more than my current body. But one thing I really strongly considered was like, okay, well, I want to photograph more candid photography and be able to take my camera everywhere. I love to do hiking. So I was like, all right, well, I you know obviously I can lug like a tripod and a massive DSLR and like a huge lens and stuff and all that gear on every hiking expedition but I probably don't want to especially as I try to travel really quite light especially if I'm like country hopping or going to multiple different destinations so I ended up opting for a very very light small mirrorless Um, I shoot a Fuji X-T20 I would probably actually recommend now that they're so on sale going with like a T3 or a T2 but basically I went with a cheaper lighter body and I did invest in different lenses so I have you know quite a large telephoto and 
um, that's quite heavy and stuff. But I have smaller lenses, so if I was just going to pack for a trip, it's pretty versatile. Like I tried to incorporate, okay, I will want to do some photography in terms of portraiture for friends, and I will want to do, you know, some more promotional shoots and some macro, and I love to photograph nature. So I tried to really, when I was selecting what sort of gear I really wanted to invest in, I was trying to think holistically, like, what really suits my lifestyle? And in addition to letting me take figure skating photos that, you know, might not be the most like professional, but still would be something I could improve on and be quite proud of. So basically what we're trying to say is that the reality is that photography is a pretty expensive hobby. You'll get out of it what you invest. Photography doesn't have to be expensive, but if you are looking to create high quality photos, you're going to have to be prepared to foot the price. And everyone has different limits for what that might be. So some people might think that spending $2,500 on a lens and camera body is insane. And I don't blame people who think that. And to some people, that's just, that's the reality. Like that's, that's what you have to deal with (laughs) if you want, um, you know, a nice body and a nice lens that lets you, uh, that lends you a little bit more versatility, better quality in your photos. Yeah, and also take into account that, you know, there are repairs that you might have to do, there's um, more investment that stacks up. So it does really depend on your budget. And I would really heavily recommend people like really do their research around the bodies, the range of lenses available, because it will serve you well to have a long-term plan for where you want to take your photography. So if you do really want to, you know, work yourself to a stage where you're shooting professionally and getting paid for your photos, then it might be worth investing in a good quality camera from the outset because you're depending on that return um, once you actually hit the stage of being able to be paid. For most people, I think if you want to keep it as an amateur hobby, it then really depends on you know, knowing what you're going to be predominantly using your camera for. So no one's really expecting to go to figure skating competitions like every single day of the year. But it is a pity to leave your camera like languishing in the cupboard. So I do really recommend picking a camera that suits your needs. Right. And I mean, one thing is that like, really, I would really highly recommend just really researching and comparing across brands like the range of lenses, how much they cost. Because like Fuji is relatively expensive in glass. Like I'll look at comparable lenses for even Canon sometimes. And I'm like, oh, I could get like a much cheaper used lens. But in terms of actual compactness and lifestyle, I really researched the lens range. It was like, you know what? I like to do landscape. I like to do macro. I like to do sports. These all have, you know, pretty accessible lenses that I could switch in and out and just try to work up towards investing. So really kind of almost construct like a mini plan in advance where these are the sorts of photography I want to aim for if I'm going to be a bit more serious about this would be one thing I would strongly recommend. And then just doing your research across brands and even going and obviously like playing around with the cameras and trying them out and figuring out what you like to shoot with is really, really helpful. So just to talk a little bit about the difference between a full frame and a crop frame camera. Um, I would say that a full frame camera, these are the professional grade cameras that you'll see the official photographers at competitions using, but I wouldn't recommend them for beginners because they are so expensive. Um, They are genuinely such an investment. I, I think when I bought my Canon 5D Mark II, that was brand new in 2011. That came with one lens. I paid probably 3,500 AUD for it. So um, that's probably the rough equivalent of like 2,700, like high 2000s in USD. So it is a huge investment um, and it only gets more expensive because an average red ring lens or professional lens for a full frame camera in Canon is easily in the thousands um, if you want to get really fancy lenses. Um, There are some really cheap lenses that you can get, but they're all in the hundreds. So it genuinely, I think people can sometimes get taken aback by the price, but that's why photography is a very expensive hobby. And I do recommend that if you are going to invest in these sorts of cameras, then you should be thinking about getting to the level where you can get paid for the photography. It took me probably like four years of shooting and being paid for my photography to sort of pay off that camera. But now that it is like that's where the return on investment actually happens. And just for like a basis of comparison, Leigh and I use a similar camera. We both have Canon 5Ds. 
when I got my first camera, that was a Canon 60D, uh, a crop sensor, uh, APS-C. I paid about $1,000 or maybe $1,200 at the time. And it wasn't even the newest model, I think. And that one came with a 18 to 135 millimeter. So those are, it's a lower quality lens with a lower quality body. And it's still over $1,000 for even a, a crop sensor DSLR. So it can, that can be pretty expensive too. So that's definitely something to take into consideration. But I do think that if you're going to be serious about it, then crop sensor and crop frame is what I'd recommend starting out. And Gab can like attest to that. Okay, so yeah, for a crop frame, that's definitely something I'd recommend using because it's cheaper. You can get the same amount of zoom or more like compared to the full frame. It's more versatile, it's lighter, and you could easily upgrade anyway. So for me, just to compare, I use a Panasonic G7. And I bought that one secondhand because I already had Olympus and Panasonic and Olympus. They use the same sort of lens, which is the Micro Four Thirds. And for my body, since I bought it used, I got it for around $700. And that included a microphone, some extra batteries, an SD card. So I thought that was a pretty good deal. And then after that, I also got a telephoto lens, which is my, as I say, my holy grail lens. And that is the 35 to 100 millimeter f2.8. And I think I got that one for about $700 too, just because I was like, searching on eBay, looking at listings for like three or four months until I got a really good deal on it. I think if like you bought it new, that lens, it would cost about $1,200, I would say. I think that's about the price. But yeah, a crop frame could come pretty cheap. But um, I just want to say that with my camera, my camera body, it broke during Skate Canada on like the last day which is very sad <laughs> that was so tragic <laughs> yeah so like it broke on the last day and i went to panasonic to get repairs and the thing is that like it took ages for them to like quote me back on how much that would be and when they did they told me it would cost 695 dollars just to get it repaired <laughs> which is what it cost yeah, like basically. buy <laughs> but since i was like yeah i'm not paying that i'm just gonna buy a new body so I was able to get a new body on eBay, no lens, no nothing, just a body with some extra batteries that came with it. And I got that for like $300, which is really good. So you could still get like really good pictures and like not pay as much as you would for like a full frame with just a crop sensor. And it's good that you mentioned that too, because one thing that is important to note is that a lot of the photo quality is determined more by the lens you use and not the body. So if you had the option between investing in a high quality lens or a more expensive, better body, always go for the lens first. The lens has longevity. Usually lenses don't deteriorate as quickly as camera bodies do, which is obviously why like Gab probably was able to find a body for pretty cheap, but lenses usually retain the same quality and you usually get better photos if you invest in the lens than if you just go for like the most expensive body. Yeah, I would also agree with that because that was one of the deciding factors and why I chose to get not as quite of a premium body for Fuji because I looked at it and compared it and was like, well, I know I want to buy this very specific lens so I can photograph figure skating as well in addition to some other things and I just was I looked at the pros and cons and honestly like the the better body I wanted was like six to seven hundred dollars more so I just went with the cheaper body which has excellent performance so it, you really you really can get a lot out of it as you do your research be prepared for how expensive lenses can be like a lot of people that don't know a lot about photography might be really surprised by that but like you, you really have to invest in lenses um, if you want to produce better quality photos. So like a lot of the more professional grade lenses are easily in like the thousand range. And that's usually not even the most expensive ones either. Like uh, there are lots of lenses that are in the couple hundreds range, but the best quality lenses with uh, higher apertures, longer focal range um, will tend to be in the thousands and that's pretty like if you can get a 70 to 200 for like a thousand dollars usd 
that is good. That is amazing. Jump on that. <laughs> right, right. And also, like, quickly, when you're researching, just as a really quick tip, if you're researching, like, what sort of camera system you want to invest in, because there's always, like, this Canon makes this glass, and then Fuji makes this glass, but check out, like, what other lenses, like, work with the mount for your camera or an adapter, because you can get some really great, like, if you're thinking more, okay, I want to balance lifestyle photography and figure skating photography, you can get some really great lenses for cheaper if you don't buy necessarily the name brand of your camera you've got a lot of much cheaper options you know most of them will be more manual lenses likely so you'll have to get you know if you're not comfortable shooting with like manual focus and other things you might have to get more comfortable with that but that's definitely something you also just want to quickly investigate on the side to double check your other options and then just finally to just quickly give an overview of the two key brands I guess at the moment is still Nikon and Canon are the two giants of the photography world. One of our ITL team members, Clara, shoots with a Nikon D7000, um, also with a 70 to 200 lens. What Nikon is tends to be famous for is their lenses are generally more affordable than Canon's. Um, and there is usually, if there is a Canon, particular type of Canon lens, there will always be a kind of a Nikon equivalent. So um, if you are going down one or the other, generally just have a look at the two different characteristics of the brands and what they're known for. And then you'll be able to commit to one or the other. And obviously, as Bex and Gabs have mentioned, um, you can also look into to other brands like Fuji, um, Sony, uh, into Panasonic and other like other types of brands as well. And obviously, don't forget um, the special lens manufacturers like Tamron and Sigma. Another one of our ITL members, Gina, uses the Canon 7D Mark II setup with a 70 to 200 millimeter f2.8 lens so that is definitely um, a great lens for Canon as well. Uh, what Gina does additionally is utilize the AI servo continuous shooting function with autofocus on for rapid multi-directional movement tracking and so basically this is a function within EOS DSLR camera bodies that basically allows you to analyze and track movement and the camera focuses the image based on where it predicts the subject will be at any given point in time and so this is often used in sports photography where the subject is continuously moving and it increases the likelihood that you're going to get a series of shots that are all in focus um, so if that is something that you have enabled in your camera, it's definitely a really useful function if you can get your head around exactly what um, it involves. All right, so moving on, we got one question from a listener regarding what sort of lenses and cameras you should avoid if you don't want security all over you. So this is relatively loaded question very, yeah, it's a very <laughs> loaded question and honestly one thing you have to understand is to think about where you're going to competitions because different feds have different standards and within those feds different competitions have different standards and different security guards for the competition have wildly different concepts of what's appropriate so let's quickly run over just like some of the basic standard specs um, in terms of permissible lenses that they formally say and then kind of what our experiences have been in actual relation to that. So the most common rule you will see about photography is no detachable lenses, which is one of the stupidest rules ever. <laughs> it really is. Barring the fact that no one ever enforces it. And most security guards don't know a thing about cameras anyway and don't realize they're looking at a detachable lens camera like 80% of the time. It's tragic. Like at, at Skate Canada once, someone tried to rip off like a $1,500 telephoto lens off my camera because they thought it was a tumbler. <laughs> like this is a kind of like not 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 anything against security guards but like the the knowledge of basic photography gear can be pretty tragic so just be prepared to like explain things a lot but yeah so a lot of competitions will have the rule that you can't have detachable lenses some will say no focal length of over 200 millimeters or they'll ban lenses that are like more than six inches in length which is the stupidest thing ever because like if you've ever seen one of those really big white lenses that's the 70 to 200 
and it's over six inches in length, but it's 200 millimeters, so it's technically within the rules. One thing to be wary of is the fact that, like, okay, sometimes if you have a fully contained zoom, like, for a much nicer, higher level lens with, you know, fixed aperture and stuff, then your lens is going to be much bulkier than if you have, you know, sort of one that just kind of extends out and sort of telegraphs out. But so, you know, you might have a lens that has, say, a 300 uh, millimeter that security will just wave by. But for the 200, they'll be like, no, 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 because it's technically a bulkier lens, even if it actually fits the stats more. So basically, in general, in terms of a rundown, Skate Canada says no detachable lenses and they have the really strict like six inches and 200 millimeters. We talked to our team member Gina who was at Pyeongchang for the Olympics and she said it was basically just as long as you didn't exceed 300 millimeters. And then the US Federation is probably the most lenient but the most inconsistent. Kat has a lot of anecdotes about that. And then I think in general European federations tend to be kind of across the board have less explicitly stated photography policies or be more lenient and then Japan is just don't bring out a camera don't bring out your phone and even try to take photos yeah no do not even try don't don't make any effort in fact I went to I started going to figure skating competitions in Japan and was so used to you know not photographing a single thing that then like six weeks after I moved back from Japan I went to ACI and completely forgot to even bring my camera because I had forgotten that one was actually allowed to photograph skating competitions in the US so that was a tragedy but yeah like these kinds of security things it's it's just it's there is no right answer to get past security it just depends on what the situation is like Gav because her again her camera is pretty small and even her telephoto is pretty small she can probably get in a little bit easier it's a lot daintier than say if you're shooting like a canon like 70 to 200 Gab, did you ever get stopped by security? No, never. That's like, which is like, again, crazy to me because she has like, actually longer range in some yeah. cases. Yeah. yeah, right. Also, one thing I think Lei, I think, has been a little bit fortunate in that she's mostly shot like Milan Worlds in 2018. Tell us about Europe because. That's the real unknown for some of us. Europe was honestly very chill. Like they, I think they were more concerned about our water bottles not having caps than with my gigantic lens and camera body that was easily like five kilos. So like I can only speak to one experience where I went to Milan Worlds, um, but they were fairly lax about um, letting in like cameras. Um, I don't remember there being a very stringent policy on not being able to take cameras in. But I think while we would never encourage any listeners to break the rules and like to flout these things, I think the thing that you have to be aware of is the reason why they ban these lenses in the first place is that um, they don't want to cause disruption to other people in the audience. They don't want the perception that like, you know, we have a whole bunch of professional photographers in the crowd. And the, I think the key thing is just around the optics of like how you're shooting. So unfortunately, if you do have a full frame camera and you have a bulky DSLR, even if you're technically not breaking the rules or you're like just on the allowances, the optics to a security guard, um, to these event organizers who don't know the finer details around photography, if you're looking like you're kind of disruptive or if you're very prominently visible with your camera, that's probably what's going to get you the knock. And so that's where like having a smaller, more discreet camera can really like be in your favor. So definitely read up on the rules. I would just say like you do have to just see how the situation is on the day. Sometimes they'll be really lax. Sometimes they won't be. You just have to be polite and understanding if you're told to put your camera away. Like just, you know, don't don't fight them on that. Sometimes it's also a lot of miscommunication too between the arena or the rink um, management and the ISU because the ISU gives and also the security sometimes the security isn't even is just private security that's not for the rink so there's like three levels of miscommunication that can happen where like they'll be like oh the ISU said that we can't let you bring in this kind of thing or like sometimes the security guard said the rink is doesn't has a certain policy like there's a lot of different rules yeah I think pretty much rule of thumb one thing just to bear in mind and like they said like don't don't fight security you're not going to win it's just it's not worth it in general like if you if they give you grief over your camera just try to be patient understanding but general rule of thumb that we found one 
um, attending competitions, at least in North America, where we've tried to do more photography, is that it'll get stricter as the competition goes on. So, for example, at skit canada gab and kat and i and several other people we knew had been taking photos with our standard kit and not like sneaking our gear in really at all just going for normal bag check and then glancing at our stuff and just waving us in for thursday the practice day and then friday and then once we hit saturday the day of the freeze they were doing much more extensive bag checks and being much more suspicious of our gear um even though the fact that they had basically waved us through the two prior days or for U.S. nationals, once I ran in and, you know, Saturday, they didn't even glance at my camera gear. And then Sunday, they were like, what? You can't use this. And I had literally emailed the U.S. Fed four times to request their camera policy. So I just, you know, politely like told the security guard that I understood and that it wouldn't be a problem and then proceeded in. Um, and they didn't give me grief. But you can have generally rule of thumb. It's going to be stricter as it goes on. So just be aware of that. Try not to be too upset. I think just never go into the competition assuming that you're entitled to take photos, but definitely bring your camera because you don't want to be there, see like everyone else, like, you know, see security being really lax about cameras and then not have your camera there. So just always be prepared, prepare for the best case scenario. But if the security is truly like giving you grief and not letting anyone shoot, then just like accept that and enjoy, you know, watching the competition with your actual eyes. Because at the end of the day, like that's it. Trust me, it, we totally understand the frustration of sometimes being denied your camera, but then you look out in the audience and someone is shooting with like a massive lens or something. Oh, yes. <laughs> we get it. <laughs> we totally get that. Yes, we, we understand the agony. Just try try to be patient. And you know what? If you're not having to shoot, you, you can actually focus on the competition mm-hmm, better, which, mm-hmm. you know, is not always the best comfort, but like... Like, it can be nice. That was my experience at Four Continents because the only event I did not get to actually shoot at Four Continents was the Pairs Free. Right. So <laughs> I did not get any Soy and Han free photos at all. So um, another key sort of theme in the questions that came out uh, was whether or not we actually get to enjoy the like watching the competition while photographing. Specifically, we've been asked, do you see jumps when you photograph and does photographing skaters help you with insight on their tech abilities? So I think personally from experience, I try very much to watch the actual competition as much as I can with my own eyes. Um, and when I'm photographing, the, the camera is sort of your second eye. All it does is really just focus your field of vision. So I mean, when you're seeing jumps as you're photographing if you're photographing on burst mode you won't see them necessarily like when you're in the moment of taking photographs but it's also not as though you go completely blind either you just see it in a different way to if you are watching with your own eyes that this is where i think having a zoom lens with a really high zoom such as a 200 or a 300 is amazing because it actually gives you more than what your eyes can see or at least me because my vision's like super poor (laughs) so like you know if you're sitting far away you can get a close-up view on details that you won't be able to see with your own eyes um so i actually really quite enjoy that experience um but yeah it is hard to get a holistic picture if you are focused on taking like a close-up of a jump or a spin or anything like that i personally hate shooting jumps and spins I just feel like it's really hard to get a good photo of a jump you can't tell what the jump is also usually if it's at midair you do get you know funny faces and stuff which is kind of amusing while you're going through all of the other photos or if you're taking maybe like a burst of a jump then you can get the entire you know take off and landing but in general individual jump photos are not as aesthetically pleasing like you can maybe if you're looking at like takeoffs um like lutz edges and flip edges from a proper angle like those can be nice to look at but it's rare that you get it yeah my advice basically if you want to photograph people in the air like photograph pairs because you can get some really cool twists and really cool throw photos as long as a man isn't like grimacing too much Um, which is (laughs) unfortunately common but You know, like, if you want to really photograph, like, kind of a dramatic aerial shot, like, Pez is a better discipline than singles. If you're seated in a corner that's really fantastic for capturing the landing of a jump, 
that can be really fun to get because you can really see a skater's extension and the angle and really capture kind of the fierceness and moment of a landing. So I wouldn't necessarily discount that. But in general, shooting jumps is just like, you know, additions to your comedic private gallery. (laughs) To be fair, like if you like photographing spins, I would say jumps are a lot iffier. Spins can give you a lot of appreciation for position and also give you a lot of appreciation for skaters who have amazing, like who have not, not even just funny faces, but amazingly serene faces and increase your respect. Like I think one of the most fun things about shooting a full competition, especially if you go to practices, is finding like a skate or two who you didn't really care about that much or you weren't that impressed by like just watching on a screen or whatever. And then you sit down and you photograph them a bit and you review the photos and you're like, wow, they look perfect in like every photo. Like their expression is amazing or the lines are amazing. Like, okay, like I wasn't quite like, you know, a frothing at the mouth, you know, Alina fan. And then I went to Grand Prix final and I photographed her a bit and I was like, she photographs so well. Like her expression, her extension in spins is gorgeous. Or like her lines are beautiful. And it can really give you appreciation for a skater that you don't anticipate. Or like you photograph a junior and you're like, okay, well, I'll just take a few shots and then you review them and it's stunning. So I think that is adds a lot of just like appreciation for the sport in general. In terms of insight on tech abilities, like, yeah, I tend to avoid jumps and spins, but it's really telling which skaters have produced the most aesthetically pleasing lines and figures if you shoot through like their step sequence or just shoot you know just shooting a program and looking at their lines like skaters that produce aesthetically pleasing line every single frame are the ones like you you kind of have an appreciation for just how beautiful they are um, when you look through the, the photos um, like there are some skaters where you know like you can complain about you know, posture or, you know, those things. And they don't become apparent until you look at their photos. So the next question we had was whether we had figure skaters we like to photograph more than others. For me, I just like photographing any skaters that I really like. So I really like photographing Junwan. There's no surprise there. (laughs) Um, But I also, like, if I don't have anyone I particularly like to photograph in a group who's on the ice, I do like to photograph whoever has the most interested costume. So whether it's, like, the sparkly stuff or, like, just anything with any interesting detail, I would, like, end up photographing them a lot. Good costumes are such a draw in terms of just being like, yes, yes, you are worthy. Especially if they're sparkly. (laughs) yes sparkles please aka ice dance ladies like 90 percent of the time deliver with their costumes yes like (laughs) one thing that is so beautiful about like picking who you're going to photograph is like oh ice dance ladies and just ladies in general show up looking usually fabulous most practices even so and then you have the men with like 80% 80% black costumes or monochrome. <laughs> yeah, it is tragic. It's a tragic contrast. And ladies tend to have better expression too when photographing, so that's always nice. Unless you're Yuzuru Hanyu. Sorry. Yes, yes. that's just yes. Come of out. course. <laughs> yeah. No, he's, he's, he's a dream to photograph. Genuinely. Like, I tend towards skaters that I think that have beautiful lines and have expression that goes through their whole body, from their head to their fingertips. I am really drawn to the way that skaters use their hands. So I love photographing skaters like Yuzuru and Soyan Han, and especially Wenjing and Satsuko Miyahara, Aliona Kostonaya. Like they have such beautiful hands. Um, and it really comes out in photos, I think. Like the lines are gorgeous and I love I love photographing them. Even Shoma too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, Shoma's very charismatic. Also, Shoma gets points just for usually having extremely good expression. Although he's very he's quite fast. Yeah, he is that this is another thing that you get with photographing is that sometimes you actually start like Wakaba, Shoma, Yuzu, etc. are really fast. So sometimes it's actually be- easier to get a better shot of a slightly slower skater or someone who's just taking their time a bit more. They knew him pretty fast. They they knew him by you and you're like, hang on, hang on. I, I had that frame perfectly and then reviewed and like, ah, oh, yes. So sort of quite related is also the question of how difficult it is to take good photos of skaters. And I would actually say my top tip, especially for skaters that you really want to photograph, is to study up on their programs and really know like when they're hitting those photogenic moments. So like for Yuzu, for example, like I 
will focus on his hydro blade, on his inner bower, like on the jump landings. So that actually gives me time to like know when to pace myself when I'm shooting. So I'm not constantly like just, you know, photographing whatever and wherever and just following him around with the camera. It's about like knowing, okay, the moment is coming and really almost prepping your composition and your camera to where you know that he's going to do that move and then just really taking lots of burst mode photos like while he's going through that and then just putting your camera down. I think that really helps um, because you have a higher chance of really focusing on that one shot um, rather than splitting your attention throughout the entire program. I completely agree with like becoming familiar with the program whether it's like you know you already know the program or um, you're watching it it practice but like when I was at Four Continents I I knew specifically that I wanted a shot of Rika during the step sequence I knew that she was going to be right in my corner facing me when she did the little arm thing right, right at the end of the step sequence so I like really wanted to get like a shot of that like from my corner so and I did get that shot and also I wanted a photo of Kauri's spiral as well her spiral sequence her Y spiral right in my corner as well um, so I was really happy that I got that as well. Yeah, so it's a lot of it is about watching for the program and practice, going to practice is also that's where it's really helpful because you can get a preview of where all these key moments are happening. So if you know like that, you know, the hydro blade is happening on the other side of the rink, like don't even bother like photographing that, just, you know, use that energy to prep for like the moment that you, you will be able to capture well. Um, and I think that's a key way of being able to ensure that you're still enjoying and processing the program and not just frantically trying to keep up with your camera and shooting like wherever. So a quick question from Courtney Milan, I think addressing um, our previous point about like point and shoot cameras. So people who really don't want to, you know, dive into this very expensive world of DSLR photography, there are definitely still options available um, if you want to do more than just your iPhone. So what Courtney's asked is, um, last season, my iPhone only takes very blurry pictures and she wanted something better but doesn't want to spend a huge amount. So she's wondering, is something like a 40 times zoom going to be enough? So basically, anything is better than an iPhone, especially if like just having a camera that has a bigger sensor than your iPhone helps a lot. And also, if you just want to use your iPhone, we could also recommend just using your camera and using it on video mode and then taking screenshots of your recorded video because sometimes those end up way better than what your camera would take while it's on like zoomed in. So for point and shoot, something like a 40 zoom would definitely be enough, but sometimes the quality won't be that great. I used to have a point and shoot and that one was 26 times zoom and it was an optical zoom. And the thing about that is that it had no like IS, so it was like not stabilized. So even if I was in maximum zoom and my settings were all right, like the slightest shake, even just me holding it as steady as I could, it would still have like some motion blur in it because it just couldn't. Yeah, so I think from experience, what is the best thing to do is actually to go to a camera store, like physically go there. Um, there will be experts who are, whose job is to sign, kind of help you and you can hold the camera in your hand. It really does make a difference because you can read up on all these articles online, but it's the fastest and best way is to just actually go talk to someone about what you need and they'll have recommendations as well. So moving on, one user asked us generally just what we use for editing and posting of our photos. I think we all pretty are unified in that we primarily use Adobe Lightroom. Yes. And Photoshop sometimes. Yes. But a Lightroom is the best if you have a ton of photos <laughs> that you want to edit on the fly. <laughs> yes. It's very, it's very handy in that regard. It integrates pretty well and you have a lot of flexibility with it in terms of how you choose to process your photos, which is wonderful. We will just flag, obviously, that Adobe Lightroom comes at the moment, I think, with the subscription to Adobe Creative Cloud. So it, it isn't the most financially like flexible and accessible program to use. But if you are like serious about shooting more, it's definitely the program to invest in if you're going to be like seriously editing your photos and shooting a lot because it just has everything in the interface designed to help you 
organize and edit your photos best. But also if you're a student, a lot of universities will offer discounts or a free subscription as well. So keep that in mind too. So if you're a student, go check your university's free software and downloads. I'd also just take this opportunity to really emphasize the importance of editing your photos. So I think that's actually the the one quality that I find is different from any other person with like a phone camera even versus like someone who is starting to learn about photography is the fact that editing is what gives your photos your own distinctive character. So you should absolutely edit your photos. All photographers do. So don't ever feel like it's lying or like, you know, not authentic because no photography um, that you'll see on advertisements and in the real, like out in the world um, has not been edited, even if it's just color correction or whatnot. You can even start, if you don't have access to Lightroom or professional editing software, there is free software available. There is things like GIMP and Fire Alpaca and all of these programs online that you can download that kind of dupe um, Photoshop. So things like editing the contrast and um, the highlights and shadows of your photography is very easy with those programs. Um, and I also recommend if you can transfer your photos to your phone and you're not looking to kind of um, have really, really big files and you're just looking to post on Instagram or on Twitter, an app like ViscoCam or Snapseed. Yeah, I just want to add in that like um, last year during Autumn Classic, I was helping Carly on how to edit her pictures and I just recommended Snapseed and she's been using it ever since. If it's just simple editing, uh, yeah, there's a lot of really good mobile apps as well. So definitely look into those. It doesn't, editing doesn't have to be inaccessible, but you definitely should edit. And while we're talking about editing, um, if you do want to like kind of take your photography and editing to the next level, um, we always recommend shooting in RAW. Um, so there are two main photo file formats that you probably are familiar with, JPEG, and then the other is a RAW photo. So basically a JPEG file is usually like, if you shoot with JPEG, basically your camera processing the image already into a, a smaller compressed form. And so it takes up way less space in your, um, in your memory card. So if you want to like save space, shoot in JPEG because it, you can take thousands of more photos if you shoot in JPEG. But the raw photo is basically just your camera taking the info from the sensor and just leaving it uncompressed. So you have all of the raw data essentially um, from the image. So what that lends you is a lot more flexibility while you're editing because you will have way more range in like what you can edit, like the saturation or just any quality of the photo you can kind of play around with a lot more readily than if you just shoot in JPEG. But the downside is that they are very, very large files. So they take up a lot of space um, in, your, in your memory card. Yes. So post-processing, yeah, you'll be a lot less frustrated, but in general, buy an extra card or something. Yeah, and don't be put off if your raw photos look kind of weird or dimly lit or whatever. They're designed to, because they're saving all that information, they're waiting for you to edit. So a lot of people will be like, oh, but my JPEG image looks so much better. That's because the computer's already made those decisions about contrast and lighting and highlights for you. Whereas if it's raw, it's like a blank canvas, essentially, for you to work off. So definitely look into shooting that. So I think we've run through a lot of our insights, obviously, as amateur photographers. And as we may have hinted through talking about our very, very expensive full frame cameras, the story is quite a bit different for professional photographers who are officially um, licensed uh, and qualified and accredited to shoot competitions. And I think a lot of people who do follow figure skating will know this next photographer that we are about to interview. His photos are much beloved by many in the fandom. So I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to interview him and here it is. So thank you so much for joining me in this interview, Jusup. Is that how you pronounce your name? Would you be able to introduce yourself um, and tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, Jusup is um, how um, English speaking people call me. Uh, when I lived in Australia, people called me um, Chosep, Chesep, Chosep, Joe, <laughs> and uh, stuff, stuff like this. So actually, yeah, I lived in Sydney for a while and 
Cho was the name they used there because Aussies are obviously short, shorten everything. <laughs> and I was fine with that. So I don't really, you know, care how people call me because um, if they try to speak with me, then I'll get the point. So it doesn't really matter much. So um, Joe, Joseph, uh, in Estonian, it's uh, actually Josep. Josep. Which, yes, sounds a little different, but it's awkward when I hear it from my English speaking person. So Joseph is like sounds better, <laughs> actually. So I don't, I, I don't know the answer to that question, to be honest. But um, anything will do, really. Right. So you've got several names, um, but <laughs> exactly. I totally understand. It sounds strange to hear like the native pronunciation when speaking English, right? Exactly. Like English speaking people can never get close to how Estonians pronounce it. So I am okay with everything. <laughs> right. Okay. So maybe, shall I call you Joseph? It's fine. Joseph? Yeah. You, Joseph. Yeah, okay. That's good. All right. We'll call you Joseph from now on then. So I hear you're from Estonia originally. Is that where you grew up and where your background and family are from? Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm from Tallinn, Estonia, which is the capital of uh, Estonia. And uh, yeah, born here and been here um, for, um, yeah, I was here for 24 years and then I left to, yeah, to Sydney uh, for um, four years. Then I came back and now I'm um, living in um, Malaga, Spain for the winter season and, uh, and Tallinn, Estonia for the summer season. So so yeah, I don't really have a home at the moment, but you're my countryman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, oh, perfect. Um, and how did you come to go? Like, how did you go to Sydney and Malaga? What, what was the reason for for leaving Estonia? Leaving to Sydney started when um, I was um, shooting sports in in Tallinn um, for um, I'd say like six, seven years, and I achieved. Uh, everything I could in this tiny country of, uh, of Estonia. And I just felt that I needed to test myself or prove that I can do sports photography in, in an international level. So I just figured I had to kind of leave and go somewhere else and, you know, try my skills out. And I, I thought maybe, you know, uh, UK or uh, the States or Canada, or Australia, and, and then in the end, I just picked Australia because it's the furthest. So <laughs> if I if I don't succeed, there is no way of coming back. Like I need to grind as hard, so I eventually succeed. So that was the reasoning behind uh, choosing Sydney. Oh, amazing! <laughs> yeah, and I'm I went to Sydney as a backpacker first because it's not easy to just jump into a new country and you know start getting um, work for um, your profession so um, I had to do all um, you know, jobs that backpackers do for a little while uh, invested in um, equipment and got some contacts and eventually I got a freelance contract with uh, Getty Images in Sydney so yeah it's actually a long story but uh, that's a long story short for now. Oh my goodness that's amazing did you uh, pick fruit and stuff as all backpackers in Australia tend to do? Oh, yeah, I, uh, I picked fruit. Um, I did removals, construction, all that type of stuff. And the funny part is I was a basketball referee first when I was like 14, 15. After that, only photography. So when I went to Australia and started doing all these construction and removals and fruit picking and stuff, it wasn't uh, the easiest of times, to be honest. But yeah, I managed and um, in the end, like it worked out. So I'm actually proud of it. You know, I didn't collapse in distress. <laughs> I just kept going, kept going, and it worked out in the end. So, yeah. Yeah, I imagine you must have hustled very hard from a young age in the photography business. How did you get into photography at the start? My dad is a sports journalist, so I'm a big fan of sports overall. Like, um, I used to do, uh, and I, I'm still uh, quite active doing uh, all types of different sports. Um and it all started when I started going different sporting events with my dad being like toddler pretty much. So this is where my passion for sports uh, started. And I think I was around 12, 13 years old. Uh, and I always loved drawing and, you know, artsy type of stuff. Um, and uh, in my school, we had... Um, arts class where we had to do um, some different assignments and 
a lot of people drew and painted and stuff, but I thought, you know, being a lazy person, um, obviously, <laughs> uh, there um, could be an easier way of doing all that. And then I discovered photography. And um, from day one, I couldn't see it myself, but uh, all other people who saw my images said that I kind of have the creative eye and uh, I can see the patterns and, and lights and darks and contrast and all this type of stuff, composition. And yeah, um, after that, like it all started quite quick. So I could um, just follow um, other photographers um, from the newspaper where my dad worked, just kind of hang around with them and see how they do stuff. And I had my own um, camera at the time as well. Um, it wasn't really a pro camera, but um, <laughs> it, it made sharp pictures. Uh, so I started shooting yeah, different events and stuff. And after maybe a year or so, then I started showing my images to the newspaper when journalists came back from the games, um, if I, especially when I had something good. So um, I remember I always printed out my top five pictures or something and put them on the keyboard of the journalist who was writing the story. So he couldn't <laughs> keep on typing because he saw my pictures. And if sometimes some of those pictures were better than the newspapers photographer had, so they kind of had to use mine because they showed the moment better than yeah, the editorial photographer of the newspaper. So um, yeah, this is how it all started. And at one point, um, I think my skill got to a point where the newspaper, uh, it was a better idea to kind of hire me because I was making better pictures than the other photographers in the newspaper. So yeah, and I was, uh, I think I was 15 or 16 at the time. When I got hired, um, amazing. Uh, yeah, it was part time first uh, because um, you know I had to attend classes in school as well. But yeah, anyway, um, early start uh, for uh, for my profession. Yeah, very early and impressive start. And what was the tipping point for you deciding to make photography, I guess, your full time profession? Hmm, I don't think I've ever really thought about. Okay, now that's the point where. I will become a professional sports photographer. It's just, I really love to be in the sporting environments, you know, in the stadiums and seeing the big games and stuff. So with or without, without a camera, it didn't really matter much at first, but once, uh, like my skill got to a point where my pictures started to look good as well, then I really felt uh, that I could, I could keep on doing that and, you know, make money and make a career out of it. So. There wasn't really a tipping point. It's just a smooth transition from being a school kid to being a um, sports photographer, really. Amazing. Not, not many people go through such a nice transition, but it sounds like it was very natural for you. Yeah, true. But one thing is I'm kind of hyperactive as well. So I really need to do something all the time, run around. And, you know, like that's why um, I really love sports myself. That, um, I can just switch my brain off and you know, throw a ball or play golf or whatever. So if I really love doing something, I give 110%. And this is how I think um, it was easy for me with photography as well, because I did it, you know, 24 seven, pretty much. I even thought about it while I was sleeping. So <laughs> I got better real quick. So yeah, and it's, I think it's with everything. Like if, if I decide that I want to do something, then either I do it or I don't. And with this mindset, it, it's easier to kind of get there faster. Yeah, sounds like a good philosophy. So I just want to move quickly on to uh, a little bit about photographing figure skating specifically. So I know that you cover a wide variety of sports um, and you shoot a whole bunch of different tournaments. Um, is there something unique about photographing figure skating compared to the other sports that you tend to photograph? Yeah, of course. Well, there's um, with all the team sports and stuff, there is um, like the peak moments where they score a goal or uh, in athletics when they cross the, the bar or stuff like this for cross the finish line. But in figure skating, I feel like it's it's more of artistic flow if, if you get to get my idea it's 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 more about resonating than one peak moment at least for me i feel like there um 
like artists like myself and dancing with skates pretty much and kind of um, arts of of movement if that makes sense yeah absolutely <laughs> so um me being um a more artsy person myself i really like shooting figure skating because um it's more than a sport it's not just you know whoever crosses the finish line first it's it's about um what skaters do on the ice what they do after they've competed what they do before it's the whole um yeah environment of of that so yeah absolutely the entire process right of i guess because figure skating is partially about performance as much as it is a sport uh do you set out when photographing figure skating competitions with sort of a goal in mind in terms of like which shots are you most eager to take or which shots are you really looking for when you're, you know, following a competition? As I'm shooting this uh, for the ISU, that means I have better access than other photographers. So um, my main goal is to have different pictures than everyone else. I'm willing to miss peak moments, uh, but if I get different pictures of, of that same routine or something, then I'm happy. So, so my main idea is to uh, use my um, axis as as much as I can. So get really close to the uh, the skaters and um, get some portraits and stuff because I know other photographers can't really move that much. So yeah, um, I really want to capture the vibe of uh, of the skaters before they go on the ice and obviously the the performance itself and then when they've finished their um, their skating so so yeah it's 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 more about uh, trying to reflect on the vibe that they're having before and after they've uh, skated and you say as an isu photographer you get um, greater amount of access does that mean because i think i know at least for japanese competitions for example the photographers are assigned to like a specific place and they must sort of stay in that area do you get more, I guess, room to move around? Is that what you mean by access? Yeah, exactly. Um, I can move around, like I can't step on the ice when they're performing, but that's about it. Like I can go wherever. I just need to be sure that I'm not uh, in way of uh, TV cameras and such. Um, so I really try to make myself invisible, um, you know, just for safety. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I, I can move around freely everywhere. Also dressing rooms and stuff. So that's what I've been doing for the last two seasons, trying to really get really intimate shots with the skaters and kind of show in behind the scenes more than more than just the performance itself. Yeah, absolutely. I think what something that you are very known for, I guess, amongst figure skating fans is the very fact that you have these very distinctive warm-up shots of the skaters and sort of very unique framing um, of the pictures. So a lot of the time, a lot of shadow in the foreground, for example, and all of that. So is this techniques that you apply specifically to figure skating or stuff that you like to shoot in other instances as well? Yeah, like this is it's just my style. I try to... I don't really think about when I'm shooting, like I just do it and the, the, how these dark background pictures happen is usually when I scout um, around the warm up areas. Uh, I try to find um, spots where for some reason there is more light than in other places. And I try to expose for that specific spot and then I really hope for someone to walk into that spot. <laughs> so this is how so so that's that's how i you know go about the, the business right hope and pray yeah exactly well it's all about light anyway like if if there is no good light then even a good moment it doesn't look that good if there is if the light is good then i can just have someone walk in the light and it works like i i get the picture that's different so that, that's that's really my approach um to shoot in all these um, yeah warm up shots and and everything else like try to try to find good light and if I have good light then good pictures will happen. Right. Um, and what's sort of I guess the most challenging part about photographing figure skating in particular and what do you do to overcome I guess those challenges? Well, it's um, sometimes it's if the routine if the skater does his step sequences and 
all these things where I know I can get good pictures of, but on the other side of the rink where I am, <laughs> then it's sometimes, sometimes it's tricky to get these, um, the shots that um, I'm not known for, you know, the standard action stuff. But if, if it's not just happening on my end, then it's sometimes tricky. Like, well, I usually get few anyway, but if it's Yuzu Rohanyu and he's on the other side skating there for, you know, three minutes and then 30 seconds he comes to my side, then obviously I'm not happy about the <laughs> whole situ situation. But I've managed so far, like I'm, I carry lenses that reach the other half as well, but the quality isn't really the same. So I can get pictures, but they're not the pictures I would really want to get. So. So I think that's the most challenging part. Do you have any ideas how I could overcome that? <laughs> You're the expert here. <laughs> have, a, have a chat with Yuzuru before for the comp competition. <laughs> Tell him to stand <laughs> in a particular place. Yeah, exactly. Hey, hey, Yuzuru, can you skate on the other side this time? <laughs> <laughs> have you spoken to skaters like while you're photographing because i know for example you've taken portraits of like shoma uno and a whole bunch of other skaters that look very intimate did you talk with them before taking it or was it very much candid a lot of those pictures are candid but some of them if i have time on sunday before and the gala exhibition then and the skaters are warming warming up then they're relaxed and and if I ask them to pose for me, then they're usually cool with this. Like I've, I haven't had a skater who said no, if I, if I ask them for portraits and yeah, yeah, I do. I do speak with them quite a lot. Um, I mean, not during the competition, but uh, before and after. What do you usually talk to them about? <laughs> well, as I've shot a lot of, you know, really famous people so i don't really get um uh, how do you say that stars struck is that is that the one? starstruck yeah yeah yeah. Um, yeah like last year i uh, shooting fifa world cup um i shot you know putin and macron had a chat with uh, macron actually so oh my goodness <laughs> yeah so so having a chat with skaters i just take them um professionals like i am so we're equal i try to make um you know feel like we're all equal and that's how the chats are really um organic and uh, and looks like they tend to like this um approach so they're really co cool with me and it's really easy to yeah talk to them and get some cool portraits because i think they know as well what i'm doing so if i ask them for portraits they're happy because they can see these images and use these images later themselves so so yeah yeah i find um i guess sometimes shooting portraits a lot of people are quite awkward because they are nervous and they don't know what to do in front of the camera but i imagine for skaters they're very used to being performers and they would know their angles does that make the process easier yeah exactly that's this is one of the reasons I really like shooting figure skating because they're all artists as well. So it's really easy to get the idea across what I'm trying to get. And it's for them, it's pretty easy to, you know, understand what I'm after. And yeah, they're really good at giving me the poses or the expressions that, that I need for this photo. So, so yeah, that, that's one of the big things I really love figure skating for because trying to shoot some other athletes say um, footballers or basketballers it's not as easy to get these you know nice portraits intimate portraits because um they, they'd be in, in the studio just crossing their arms and just looking at the camera and like what do you want me to do and i'm like <laughs> you know it's re it's really tricky they're so stiff but yeah figure skaters are um, so much better but that's their job anyway to kind of look like um, they're flowing or something, right? Makes my makes my job easier. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They're actors as well, right? So it's it's very different. Um, so just related, I guess, to um, we mentioned before, you said a lot of the shots you take were candid of figure skaters. How do you, I guess, in a competition, decide when to shoot and when to hold back? Because a lot of the time, I suppose, photography is about knowing when the right moment is. So do you have any kind of thoughts on when do you know it's sort of the right moment to be taking that particular shot? I think 
like uh, it all has to do with the emotions like um, when they're preparing for competition uh, then you can see the focus in their eyes so it's worth taking a shot because you can actually see on that image the the, the tension and the concentration and obviously after the the performance when they walk off you can see emotion in their eyes if they the performance went well or not and so the i mainly try to grab shots when i know that the image shows emotion um so this is the best time when there is emotion uh, when they're feeling something you know so um, th this is the perfect time i think when they're just uh, you know a few days before the competition uh, training or practicing then you can't really get these uh, tense portraits if you know what i mean that's when the it's most intense right e exactly then you can yeah feel the tension and the watching the image so yeah just a few more questions um just yeah, sure. curious i guess about um we were talking before about you know the frustration of having great moments happen across the rink um i believe we have seen you on like japanese news um in the background and you've been walking around with multiple cameras so just quickly what's your setup in a typical i guess isu championship are you carrying multiple cameras what sort of lenses do you like to use so i'm i'm carrying three cameras they're all canon 1dx and my main lens for the action everything happening on the ice is a 200 millimeter lens f2 nice i also have a 400 millimeter f2 8 just in case they're all skating on the other side of the rink so i can just <laughs> Use use my four hundred. Uh, or the beads of sweat right on their forehead if they're standing close. <laughs> yeah, but the, the the thing is, I only use four hundred mil as a backup because its image image quality is obviously really good. But my two hundred f two is better, so I really try to use my two hundred f two as much as I can. But yeah, obviously, um, if it happens on the other side of the rink, I just can't reach with the 200. So that's two cameras. Did you say you had a third as well? Yeah, my third one, I usually use um, either 35 mil uh, one, F1.4 one or my 85 mil uh, 1.4. Uh, so I'm only using fixed lenses because the quality is, uh, is so much better. I have to work harder to get sharp images with these lenses but once i get a sharp one it's it's good like there is i can't do it better um, with any other setup than the setup i have are you shooting at at 2.8 and 2 when you're taking the photos yeah I, i'm wide open all the time oh yes that would be tricky <laughs> it is tricky but i like challenges like um i want every competition every every time i go shooting every assignment to be a challenge like um, if it's too easy then it gets too comfortable for me then it gets boring and when it gets boring it's it's no good so i really you know try to make it as hard as possible but uh, on the other hand like i get nice pictures doing that as well i miss a lot of moments but the ones i i, I get are, are good yeah and i guess natural flow on from that what's been some of your favorite figure skating moments or photographs do you have any sort of memorable stories that come to mind i think yuzu rohanyu must be the skater who's photographed and the photos turn out real good because of his um yeah, emotions and um, especially preparing just um maybe 30 seconds before going on the ice um, his focus and his aura is, is just different. Um, I think he's the most famous figure skater as well. So having good pictures of him, I know that people will love this. So I really try to yeah, get some cool stuff of him and, um, it has worked out a few times and hopefully it will work out in the upcoming season as well. So, but nothing, um, nothing super special. So like I take event at a time. Like every event has its moments and uh, on overall, um, yeah, there's, there's nothing that stands out that much. I can't really yeah, remember. Haven't been lying on the ground or in crazy positions to get the shot. I'm always in a crazy position. So that's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I'm always trying to get as low angle as possible. So 
yeah that's um actually <laughs> in instagram they call this uh, my signature style <laughs> oh really yes so just lying on the ground as low as possible on my tummy and yeah then yeah have all my lenses around me and yeah i have my headphones on because this just cancels one of five senses so i can concentrate more on the visuals i can't hear the fans screaming and stuff so if people ask me like what music are you listening to when you shoot figure skating then I just, yeah, I don't listen to anything. These are my noise cancelling headphones that just uh, give me that little bit more focus or edge. Oh, that's fascinating. I might have to try that, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah. Try yeah. it out. It's good. Goodness. Yeah. Okay, great. One final question, because I know I've had you here for quite a while. But um, as, I guess, an amateur photographer myself, what we've noticed is that in competitions where photography is allowed it's becoming quite like accessible in general. Uh, a lot of you know professional grade cameras can be bought by amateurs and it's quite common to see audience members taking photographs um, in the crowd of figure skating competitions. Is that something that you've noticed and do you have any particular thoughts on, I guess, that phenomenon? Is it unique, I guess, to figure skating to see audience members taking photographs well i think it's good for figure skating like the more uh, photos people are publishing the more uh, outside world can see these um, cool images but i haven't really noticed because um, i'm in my own zone during the competitions so i don't really you know look around and try to find uh, 400 mil lenses in the in the crowd but <laughs> i'm sure they're there probably yeah yeah um yeah, but I haven't really noticed and I hope they're getting um, good pictures, but I know I have better access and uh, <laughs> if they're not next to me, then their pictures will be good, but it's really hard to get something that no one else has. And I suppose if you were to give advice to enthusiast photographers in the crowd or people wanting to get into sports photography, what would be a piece of advice that you would give them? I think it all starts with the ABC, really, like the, the basics. Uh, you need to get your um, technical stuff right, you know, your shutter speeds, your ISOs and apertures, uh, white balance, um, you know, focus. And then really what I do is I listen to the music a bit when they're um, on the ice try to feel the rhythm and when you feel the rhythm then you know when the peak moments are gonna happen like the butterfly jumps and stuff it's always boom 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 jump you know it, it kind of goes like that so really try to shoot less but feel more I think that's that's how I do it um, when I started I, I, I shot maybe a few hundred frames per skater now I'm down to maybe 100 or something in total yeah maybe maybe 150 or something but yeah it's it's not much i've shot next to some of the photographers and i hear their shutter going all the time and i i could say they shoot around five to six maybe 700 frames per skater and i only do 100 so after the event i'm usually the first one that leaves the <laughs> the press room <laughs> the fastest to edit through your photos as well surely <laughs> exactly like there is you need to push when the right moment happens and um, shot before that shot after that there's no reason to you know take it but it it comes with experience uh trying to feel when the right moment happens so so yeah it takes time to shoot less absolutely I think that's the journey that all photographers go through starting out shooting a lot and then being able to have the experience to narrow it down all the way yeah exactly perfect well thank you so much for your time i think there was some really really great insight and advice in there and it was such a pleasure to speak to you yeah no worries uh thank you uh, so my first podcast in english is done oh actually one more question. Which competitions will you be at in the coming season? Have you decided or has it been confirmed? Um, yeah, it was um, confirmed last week. And I'm doing four junior Grand Prix. Uh, then I think around four senior Grand Prix, starting with, I think, Grenoble for me. 
um, in Moscow and I'll be at the Worlds in Montreal uh, in March as well. Overall, I'm, I'm doing 16, 17 events this season, but it includes speed, speed skating and short track as well. So I think I'll be around 12 figure skating events for me this season. So uh, I think that's plenty. Yeah, we absolutely look forward to you being there and all the photos that will come out of it. I do look forward to this season myself because um, I have some ideas and um, what I haven't really tried before and trying to get uh, more um, yeah, intimate moments, portraits, probably going to do some events. I'm probably going to grab some of my lighting gear as well. So maybe we can get some some cool portraits and a more um, yeah, studio look lighting in there as well. Oh my gosh. Well, that's an exclusive for us. Um, <laughs> I'm so excited. Um, and yeah, hopefully, like I will hopefully be making the trip to Montreal too. So if we like see you in the distance crouching on the ground, we'll uh, give you a yell. <laughs> yeah, no worries. If see you in Montreal, right? Yeah, fingers crossed. Well, I have a 30 hour flight before that happens. Um, <laughs> but yeah, fingers crossed that that all goes smoothly and wishing you the best time at all these competitions and good photography. Yeah, thank you. If you haven't seen them already, you can find a lot of Joseph's photos on his Instagram. Follow him at jmfotoz. You'll also find a link to his website there, which will tell you more about him and show you more of his portfolio. Well, I think that pretty much sums up uh, our entire episode on photography. So I think we just want to thank you, first of all, for listening. Um, and a special thanks to Gina and Clara from the ITL team for their additional advice. Um, our entire transcribing and quality control team, Evie for editing and Gab for graphic design. So if you want to get in touch with us and you can contact us via our website in the low podcast.com or our Twitter. Um, and you can also find our episodes on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify. If you enjoy the show and want to help support the team, then please consider making a donation to us on our coffee page. We'd like to give a huge thank you to all the listeners who have contributed to our team thus far. You can find all the links to our social media pages and our coffee on the website. And if you're listening on iTunes, please consider leaving us a rating and a review if you enjoyed the show. Thanks for listening. This has been Gab, Kat, Lei, and Bex. Bye! Bye! Bye. Bye.